Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Yellow Gloves podcast. As always, I'm your host, Chris, and today we're going to be talking about Cage Warriors 171 in Glasgow. First time in 11 years that Cage Warriors have returned to Scotland in Glasgow, and let's just say it didn't disappoint. Not as many finishes as we're used to seeing on these cards, but some really competitive fights, some still really epic moments. Um, not the greatest night for Scottish fighters, I will say. Some got their hands raised, others in big spots didn't get their hands raised, but the atmosphere seemed to be electric off the TV. I mean, it sounded insane, uh, and it's great to see Cage Warriors returning to, to Scotland, where MMA's kind of been forgotten a little bit in Scotland by, by Cage Warriors, I would say. And with the rise of guys like Sean Clancy with Reese McEwen, having uh, an absolute banger and Chris Bungard on the roster, it makes sense to come back. And I guess let's just get straight into it. We have 16 fights to talk about, so I don't want to spend my whole day on this. Uh, let's start, as we always do, we'll work our way down from the main event all the way to the first fight on the prelims. And with that, let's start with Dimitri Gerlin versus Chris Bungard. So coming into this fight, I was pretty excited for it. Chris Bungard is one of my favorite fighters in 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 our scene in in the UK. Just a, a tremendous scrapper, just a, a nasty fucker in the cage. Uh, just I, I remember one one journalist saying a few years back, like as unglamorous as it sounds, Chris Bungard is a tough cunt, and that should be like how he's remembered for his career. Uh, just a a guy who fights at a grueling pace. He wastes zero strikes in the cage. I mean, the guy's got shoulder strikes against the fence. He's always throwing something. He's always being annoying and scrappy on the ground off his back. He's always elbowing. And it's just great to see Bungard get this opportunity to headline a card for Cage Warriors in Glasgow. His walkout was incredible. One of my favorite walkouts I've seen this year uh, and will probably be there at the end of the year as one of the best. Uh, awesome tribute. I'm not a big wrestling guy, but but the Bray Wyatt tribute was really touching, and obviously the walkout with the fans going crazy is it is a special one. And I said this a couple of times, uh, and I'll say it again. If I was Chris Bungard when I'm walking out, going as crazy as he is, I, I'd get to the cage and I'd just pass out. I don't know how he does it. It's you can see all the energy coursing through him, and he just seems to thrive off it and live off it, and it, it's incredible. Um, his opponent in this fight, obviously, Dimitri Gerlin, one of the best prospects out of Italy. Debuted in Cage Warriors last year in like a truly unforgettable fashion, uh, flatlining Adam Cullen, of all people. Uh, and that was Adam Cullen's first loss of his career. And, and Gerlin was a, a major underdog. But the Italian MMA guys, they would have told you that they weren't surprised. And yes, we'd go on to see Gerlin lose his next fight against Leon Hill. Leon Hill, you know, no slouch and, and one of the best fighters in in the promotion, but Gerling got back on the horse in October last year against Simone Patrizzi, which was like a grudge match, a rematch from when they both of them first started their careers, and Gerling would go on to win that fight via third round submission. So a really interesting one here where I don't think Bungard would have been the favourite coming into this. Gerling is the, the scrappy young upstart. He's an active finisher of fights. He's athletic, but it really felt that narrative wise and energy wise it felt like the stars had aligned for Bungard and unfortunately that wasn't really the case I, I thought Bungard took the first round uh, I really liked him doubling up on the calf kick which was drawing huge reactions out of Gerlin. Uh, Gerlin eventually got the timing on the calf kick and tried to counter with the hook uh, Bungard had the patented shoulder strikes as I said that's something that was was evident to see in this one peeling Gerlin off the cage taking him down the, the round did end with, with Gerlin attacking the neck, trying to go for a guillotine, but Bungard was wrestling up, disengaging. Like I said, I scored it 10-9 for him. In the second round, Gerlin rushing Bungard, high kick right off the cuff, uh, right hand over the top from Gerlin, landed once and he just started spamming it. In doing so, Bungard just took him down of ease, seamlessly transitioned to the back and, and sat off the right hip to get the hook in. Bungard's an awesome jiu-jitsu player, uh, just Guy's just incredibly fun. It's a shame. It really is a shame that he lost here because, you know, it's just always a joy to watch him. And 
part of the fun of Bungard is win or lose, you know, he'll fight the same way next time. So you know you're always going to get some some good scrappy entertainment. Uh, but Gerlin, really good in this in this round, wrestling up, uh, going on the high elbow gilly against the fence, which sometimes, you know, you've not got enough space, but I think he really did well to kind of pin Bungard there. Got the high elbow gilly, hit pressure, a tremendous amount of hit pressure to to squeeze on on the neck and really put put all of that nasty weight of his on top of Bungard and drew the submission out of the Scotsman. And that's that's Gerlin now improves to eight and two with the biggest win of his career against the most experienced fighter he's ever fought. It's three wins now in the yellow gloves for Gerlin. I would imagine he's in the title mix now. I think it would be disingenuous to to assume that that he's not. Um, and I think it would be unfair to not put him in that conversation. He's been finishing some of the best fighters that the promotion has. Adam Cullen was undefeated and was supposed to be the next big thing, could still be. Um, but certainly Gerlin kind of stopped him in his tracks in, in dramatic fashion and showed that it wasn't just a flash in the pan beat Simone Patrizzi, who I hold in really high regard as a fun fighter. Um, and then, obviously, finishing Chris Bungard, getting the submission. Very impressive to me. Bungard, I'm sure we'll see him again. There's obviously rumours of... Well, not rumours. It's confirmed that Cage Warriors will be returning in September for their prize fighter series or, or event that they're doing. Uh, and, and that will be in Glasgow. And that will be in Glasgow. So I wonder if... Obviously, we probably won't see Bungard in the prize fighter tournament, but do we see him perhaps headline the card, uh, fighting someone who is more of a veteran? Like I, wa- I don't want to see Bungard against Gerlin and Hardwick like we have done. I want to see Bungard against the Gavin Hughes, against the 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 Goodwins. These are the guys I want to see him against. Just fellow veterans who are there to just scrap with him, and I think that's where you get the most entertainment and where you you probably position him for a big win in front of his own crowd. For Gerlin, I really want to see this guy right up there in the mix at 155 pounds. For Bungard, I'm sure we'll see him again in a fun one. This this card in, in Glasgow should be an interesting one in September because they, they should be bringing Bungard back for it. So before we move on to the co-main event, actually, something that I wanted to discuss was the atmosphere. Uh, I had a question from uh, Gary or Europe underscore MMA. And Gary asked, how did the atmosphere feel on TV? And do you think they'll go back to Scotland again? So obviously... Um, Gary would have would have tweeted this before the announcements and everything, um, and I believe he was at the event as well. So to answer the the atmosphere side of things, I think it came through really well on TV. Uh, I did mention it at the top of the episode, but it's it's always it's always crucial that when cage warriors go to these events, that folks turn up at, and turn up and make noise. Not only is it great for the fighters, it's great for the scene. I feel like the Scottish MMA scene has been left behind a little bit. Um, I think Wales is progressing quite a lot. I think Ireland's obviously you know been kind of reinvigorated over the last couple of years. I would say the Irish MMA scene, Scottish MMA scene has always been so much fun, so many fun scrappers, and they've kind of been left by the wayside. But it's events like the one on the weekend that can, you know, ignite that fire again. And the atmosphere came through brilliantly, I thought, on TV. I think it was it was loud, it was fun, uh, it was raucous. Scottish fighters weren't just winning in their droves and maybe if they had it would have been even crazier but considering you know I believe six Scottish fighters lost and six Scottish fighters won uh, and two of the losses were the were the main and co-main event and we'll get into the co-main shortly but when you have situations like that it can deflate an audience but when Bungard walked out it was electric it reminded me of of Reese McKee's famous walkout in Ireland you you get some some cool and special moments and Bungard's felt that way and it wouldn't have felt that way if not for an amazing crowd so i i think beyond just this prize fighter thing and them going back in september i think we will start to see more regular shows and i hope so you got a mega prospect in Sean Clancy Jr give it you know a few give it a year or so you'll probably start seeing him in and amongst the the big fights at 170 pounds and he's someone you can definitely build a card around, I think. So now that we've covered that, we'll move on to the co-main event, which was between Cameron Else and Reese McEwen. Cameron Else, probably familiar to a lot of people that aren't familiar with Cage Warriors, although he has fought in the in the promotion before, and uh, famously dealt Paddy Pimlet his first career loss via Anaconda Choke, I believe. But Cameron Else, like I said, uh, more famously known for fighting in the UFC, originally missed weight, 
but use the two hour grace period to to get on the scales and weigh in at 136 pounds so good on him for turning that around because other fighters on this card were not able to do so um reese McEwen really goes without any really doesn't need any introduction uh, one of the best bantamweights in europe for my money though he did lose uh, against Liam Gittins at Cage Warriors 164, which was a title fight. Just an exceptional grappler, a guy who's still figuring it out on the feet, I would say. And this fight was a really good example of that. I will preface this by saying that this fight was a split decision and the decision itself drew some contention. I will say that how I thought the fight should have been scored when it ended versus how I thought the fight should have been scored after I rewatched it. Uh, are two different end results so we'll get into this we'll break down per round like we do but it i wanted to caveat that because we will talk about the, the scorecard just after we talk about some of the fun technical stuff we saw here um round one scored it to cameron else else is usually a fast startup and and was the aggressor in this round but wasn't over committing which is good to see McEwen, you know i i i wrote this down in my notes the minute the fight started just McEwen never looks comfortable off the back foot. You watch him against Liam Gittins, you watch him against Cameron Else. And again, I think the world of this guy, I think he's a really fun fighter and a really good prospect. And one of, for me, like I said, one of the best uh, bantamweights in Europe still. But he cannot fight off the back foot. You know, that there are some tools he's got which are good, like he's got the roundhouse to the body off the back foot, which is mechanically hideous. Uh, but it landed a few times here and, and he had a step in knee to the body that was good as well. But it felt like whenever whenever Cameron Else put his foot on the gas and wanted to crack Reese McEwen, he did. Uh, the right hook was there all fight long. And in the first round, that's really what what won it for Else was the the constant striking uh, and and the constant the constant right hooks that he was landing. Round two was an interesting one for me um, because I scored it for Reese McEwen. Uh, Cameron Else's pressure again, I felt was just melting McEwen. The kicking off the back foot was just was landing but was also getting him in some trouble i tweeted this and i said that reese McEwen's path to victory is to fight fire with fire he needs to fight for position and try to take over as the aggressor which i also caveated by saying it is easier said than done against a, a firefighter like like cameron else but what i liked was the the left hand from else was crowding McEwen. Uh, potentially dropped him in this round but i thought it might have been a slip i, I Again, even on the rewatch, it didn't. It wasn't clear to me that it was a knockdown. Uh, but all that McEwen needed to do was was effectively press on the front foot. He pressed on the front foot, doubled up on his left hand, followed it up with a with a double leg, and got the takedown. And it was on the takedown where McEwen did his best work. It wasn't anything meaningful, um, you know, overly meaningful. He was striking to the body. He was winning winning the, the hand positions on, on the ground to just keep. Cameron Else down and the head position and he was making it uncomfortable for Else. He was pinning him down but he wasn't doing much with it. Uh, but I did score him the, the round 19-19 purely because the I felt like it was a slip in hit the left hand from Else. I felt like McEwen slipped and it, it didn't actually get dropped. So you know if we're talking about damage and we're talking about moments where fights were close to ending I don't think it was quite definitive who got the better of who in this round, but I felt like McEwen controlled it a lot better. Um, and, and, you know, to a lot of people may not have been doing a great deal on, on the ground, but was attacking the body quite a lot and managed to keep it there for, I think, quite quite close to three minutes. So, again, you don't ever want to get into those kind of situations where you're scoring a fight based on how long someone sat on top of someone else. But when there hasn't been a great deal to differentiate it by, and McEwen was landing on the ground, uh, I felt like you had to score it for him. Round three is where the point of contention comes in. So I'm going to be completely transparent here. I scored it 29-28 McEwen when the fight was had just ended. So I was watching it live. I felt that McEwen should have got the nod. You know, he had some great moments in this. The deep arm bar had Cameron else grimacing, like on the cusp of tapping, it looked like. He lifted McEwen and shucked him off, but that was a real momentum swinger. McEwen tackling him to the ground, attacking the head and arm choke, trying to go palm to palm, striking to the body. This was all in like the last two minutes of the round. And you're watching that as a spectator. Um, and, and this is why I've got a great deal of sympathy for judges and judges who are, are, are genuinely really good at their job. These kinds of fights, to not get swayed by the crowd, to not get swayed by narrative, takes someone who is extremely objective 
and is just extremely great at their job because if I was a judge, I would have scored that 29, 28 to McEwen um, in the moment because it just, it felt like just the energy in the arena, it felt like McEwen really came close to finishing it on the on the arm bar. But when the scorecards were read out and it was obviously a split decision, 29, 28 to Cameron Else, I knew, look, round one Else, round two McEwen, round three is the swinger. And I couldn't, you know, I, I wasn't, it wasn't one of those where the round or the fight ended and, and I was screaming robbery. And by the way, anyone who did that for this fight, watch more MMA fights because that's not, yeah, you, you've not seen enough robberies if you think that's a robbery. But what I will say is um, I really, you know, upon rewatch, like I said, scored it to Cameron Else. Left hand was crisp early, landed the left hook, smiling and taunting whenever he landed club in right hand, wobbled McEwen in this round. And I think that's easy to forget because it was early. Wobbled McEwen and followed him to the ground. And that's where um, that's where McEwen managed to get the submission attempts from. But Cameron Else dealt a lot of damage in the first two minutes of this round, two and a half minutes. And I think it was enough to swing it. Like I said, I might have got a bit swept up in the, in the momentum and, and the sub attempt of McEwen and the energy of the crowd. But it was a really, really close fight. And you can definitely argue 29-28 McEwen. But upon rewatch, I'm more comfortable with with 29, 28 else, I think. So I guess the real burning question coming out of this is what's next for Reese McEwen and what's next for Cameron Else? So for Cameron Else, obviously, good to see him back in action. Two years of, of inactivity back in the yellow gloves. It would be great to see him again. I think he's someone that you could really propel into close to title contention. He's at the latter stage of he's at the latter stages of his career. Fun as hell, and he'll always be fun. You know, he's been fighting for ages, still only gone to the decision. Uh, this was this was only the, the second time he's gone to a decision and the first time he's won one. So he is one of those guys that's just going out there trying to finish you. And just a, an awesome watch is, is Cameron Else. So he's someone that I could definitely see right up there in the title mix. And he'd be a great fight for a lot of guys. Even if you if you threw him in the title mix, and if you, even if you gave him a title shot right now, I don't think a lot of people would complain and I think it'll be a fun, fun scrap between him and Gittins. For Reese McEwen, it's a bit, it's a bit of a shame, really. Um, like I said, I, I think the world of Reese, I think he's a brilliant fighter. I would almost like to see him take a step back, but I can understand that he probably won't want to, and Cage Warriors probably won't want to. I mean, at the end of the day, it's not like he's getting blown away um, in these fights, but it's it's two losses in a row. Gittins, tremendous fire turn. He was he was outstanding on the night. Cameron Else, it could have gone either way. And so I think what would be interesting is a fight that I was really excited to see um, last year was Reese McEwen versus Dan Deutsch. And Dan Deutsch obviously fought on this card, and we'll get to that later. I think that'll be a really good one. Um, we've not seen we've not seen these two face off. Obviously, I think it would be great. Dan Deutsch is kind of on an upward trajectory, anyways. So I don't know if he'd want to fight Reese, but I still think Reese is a massive name in the European scene. And you know, it's not like I think some of the wins Reese has are, are probably better than than some of the wins Dan has, but I think that would be a fun scrap. You could also rebook the Adam Wilson fight. We've not seen Wilson uh, since his loss last year to Rory Evans, where he lost by uh, arm triangle choke. It's a bit of a step backwards for Reese, but it's a next gen MMA guy, and he's obviously just lost uh, in his title match to a next gen MMA guy. Has Reese? Maybe that's a fun one. You scale it back. You give him someone who's a bit more. A bit more beatable than some of these massive guys he's fighting. Like he's gone from Gittins to a UFC vet uh, in Cameron Else. Maybe we scale it back a little, or you throw him against Dan Deutsch and see can because these two grappling would be immense. By the way, it'd be one of my most anticipated fights of the year if they rebooked it. Interesting to see where Cage Warriors take this uh, and what they do with Reese McEwen because it could go one of two ways here. But I think it won't be a situation. You know, it sounds dramatic because it's sink or swim. I don't think it is, but I reckon they should have a, a bit of a slower build up with Reese. Maybe bring him back on that Glasgow card against an Adam Wilson type. Let him get the energy of the crowd. Let him get his hand raised and then build him back up again. Uh, maybe you wait for the Dan Deutsch fight. But if you want to book it, I ain't complaining because that's one of the best fights you can put on if you're Ian Dean right now. All right, so we'll move along on this main card. Lucas Rodriguez versus Sean Clancy Jr. Lucas Rodriguez debuted in Cage Warriors three weeks ago. Um, and here he is again. Lost a decision to Anthony Roscoe. 
um, a very long, gangly fighter. And I mean, Sean Clancy Jr., considering the fact that Orozco, I want to say Orozco struggled. I thought he was brilliant, actually. And it was good to see him go the full 15. But considering Orozco had a tough time getting Lucas Rodriguez down and, and finishing him, it's pretty immense that it took Sean Clancy a round and a half um, or, or close to two rounds, pretty much. I love the tartan shorts from Sean Clancy Jr. Makes his second appearance in the yellow gloves. Choked out Milton Cabral last year. 3-0 and as a pro, 21 years of age. 8-1 and as an amateur. All wins via finish. He's, he's the next up. He's the guy next up for Scottish MMA. And he's really someone that they can hang their hat on. I really think this guy is, is the future of Scottish MMA. And I think he can go really far at welterweight in MMA in general. Uh, and not just you know, consigned to, to Scotland and to cage warriors. I think beyond, this is a guy you could see in the UFC. I know it's still early doors, but I just, I, I love this guy. I think he's amazing. It's I get really excited with these types of fighters, guys who are mechanically sound, guys who are dangerous in all aspects of MMA, dangerous on the ground, dangerous on their feet. In round one, what I love from Sean Clancy Jr. was his calf kicks, crushing Lucas Rodriguez, forcing him to switch stances. And that that spelled the end of the fight, in my opinion. Um, the, the massive hematoma on the left leg of Lucas Rodriguez, the fact that he couldn't fight out of the out of the opposite stance. The knee to the body from Sean Clancy Jr., just very good. Straight into the double leg, off the knee, elbowing away on the ground, sneaking in the hooks. Almost had the submission in round one with his arm across the chin of Lucas Rodriguez, but not enough to get the sub. In round two, I think Sean Clancy Jr. felt in that moment, this guy doesn't want to stand with me. He probably wants to go to the ground. He's probably too weak to to defend the takedown because his 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 legs are screwed from me just pummeling them. Let me get him down. I felt him on the ground. I could have submitted him in round one. Let me see what he's got here. And it didn't really last long beyond that. Clancy punching an elbow in a way. Dan Strauss on commentary saying it was a masterclass in MMA ground and pound. I couldn't agree more. Flattened him out in the mount. Comprehensive beatdown. Again, another hematoma, this time on the forehead of, of Lucas Rodriguez. It was like a tennis ball under his skin. Clancy Jr., onslaught of elbows, onslaught of punches. Referee forced to step in. I tweeted this after the fight, and I'll say it here. Remember the name, Sean Clancy Jr. I think this guy is a shoe in to be in the UFC could easily be in contention for Cage Warriors gold in the next 18 months, I'd say, if he doesn't get snapped up by the UFC first. I think he's incredibly fun, a really good finisher, and just an intelligent fighter. This is a total, total destruction of Lucas Rodriguez, this one, to go 4-0. Still finishing fights. Be interesting to see what he looks like if he has to go the full 15, and I'm sure we'll see that with the way they match make for him. But keep an eye on the Sean Clancy Jr. guys because he he could go right to the very top. Gianluca Scatoli versus Aiden Steven is the next fight we'll talk about. And we won't talk about it for long because it wasn't great. In all honesty, Scatoli, a guy I really enjoy, a fun, a proper scrapper, had a great fight with Sam Kelly last year in his Cage Warriors debut. Aiden Steven, great to see him back in Cage Warriors. Two and a half years out of action. He's fought a real murderer's row of guys like Kingsley Crawford, Steve Amable, Collins, Paul Hughes, Emra Sonmez, Tobias Harilla, and most recently coming off a win over Edward Walls. Great to see Stephen back. Performance, he did what he had to do to get the win in front of his, his, his home crowd. I think it was important for Scottish MMA on the night because it had been a while since we'd seen some Scottish guys have been winning, but Scott Malone had lost just before. We'll talk about in a second. Uh, he did what he had to do. It was a uh, a domination on the ground, total domination. One of the judges scored it 29-28 to Stephen. I don't know how you see that as anything other than a 30-27. Blanketed John Lucas Scatoli for 15 minutes. Called for the title shot when the fight was done as he was walking down the tunnel. Could I see it happening? Yes. Is that the performance you'd get it off of? Probably not. If they're going back to Glasgow in September, don't be surprised if that's what happens. Uh, but, you know, when you, when you really kind of measure it up, you've got Cameron Else. I think Cameron Else put in a better performance than Aidan Steven. I'd say he probably edges it. But Aidan Steven definitely in, in title contention now that they're looking to reopen their their um, affiliation with Scottish MMA. 
not a fight that I want to spend a great deal amount discussing because it didn't really excite me. But my friends, what did excite me was Nicholas LeBlond versus Scott Malone. I figured this one would be fight of the night and I wasn't disappointed. Nicholas LeBlond, you all all know, is one of my favorite flyweights, a violent finisher of fights, riding a three-fight win streak uh, where he's just been decimating his opponents, coming off a, a really brutal uppercut KO over Michelangelo Lupoli last year. And also last year, he scored the first bulldog choke in Cage Warriors history. Fun thing that I was tweeting about regarding Nicolas LeBlond is that in that Michelangelo Lupoli fight, he beat an Italian fighter in Rome. In the Ryan Curtis fight, where he won by a bulldog choke, it's an Irish fighter in Dublin. And here you had a Scottish fighter in Glasgow in Scott Malone. Scott Malone, a guy who'd been away from the cage for two years, Last couple of losses have been to really, you know, reputable guys in, in Michele Martignoni and Dylan Hazan, but has wins over the likes of Josh Reed, Amara Singer, Kiru Sahota. Nine and six coming into this, but a proper Scottish MMA veteran and a guy who knows his way around a fight. And Nicholas LeBlanc definitely felt that um, until he managed to to pull it out of the bag late in the fight. Round one, I scored to to Scott Malone. He looked so good in this fight, guys. The the 3-2 over the top in round one where he staggered LeBlanc, the straight right hand. Everything that Malone threw was landing in this. And he looked like, he just looked electric, like one of the best fights I've ever seen Scott Malone put in. And it's just a shame when you fight a guy like LeBlanc, sometimes your best doesn't matter. Sometimes you can go in there, pitch an absolute masterclass and get slumped. Because that's what happened here. Round two. I thought it was closer. I still liked the work Scott Malone was doing here. Calf kick, spinning into the back fist. He was just flowing. The whole fight, he was flowing. But LeBlond had the counter right hand, which, which stung Malone. Um, the takedown against the fence, attacking the heel hook and transitioning. LeBlond was a lot more comfortable in this round, but Malone wasn't, wasn't giving up too easy. I did score it 10-9 to LeBlond. So I had it 19-19 going into the third. I felt he dealt the better strikes and, and had dominated the fight, uh, dominated the round, sorry. Uh, but Scott Malone was still doing some great things. In round three, still the same. Malone tagging LeBlond up with the 3-2, rushing forward, landing, lead hook to the body, stunning, kicking the calf. At this point, I thought, well, it's probably, that's probably it for LeBlond. He's going to lose uh, a decision to a guy in Scott Malone who looked amazing on the night, but someone who is coming off of two losses and this is a big spot for LeBlond at 125 pounds and LeBlond just nails Malone with a stunning counter left hand after drawing Malone out with the right hand as well follows him to the ground lands huge elbows and powerful follow-up shots it's three wins in a row that's three wins behind enemy lines eight of his 10 wins via finish I need this man's left hand to be studied by science I don't know what he carries in his gloves. I don't know what they're feeding him in France, but Nicolas LeBlond is one of the best, I'll say it right now, one of the best flyweights in Europe. 10 and 4 now. I love watching this guy fight. I think he's so entertaining. I don't know how, I don't know how as a flyweight he can carry so much power and still be, you know, have, have a good gas tank and not be someone that fights in one you know, one of these guys that fights for one round and gets a, a finish. And if they don't, they kind of tail off. He's there with you the whole time. Like he's got finishes late in his late in fights. He's got finishes early in fights. Nicholas LeBlanc for me is one of the best rostered fighters for Cage Warriors. I'd love to see him in title contention right now, but I, I don't know if they'll, they'll throw him in straight away. Certainly there seems to be a lot of people lining up at 125 pounds. But if you've got Lana Kavanaugh, joining uh, the UFC or, you know, going on the contender series, which I think is stupid. And I think he should have got the call straight up, but you do what you do. He is still young in his career. Maybe you put LeBlond in there with Shadj. We've not seen Shadj yet this year. I don't know when they're going to book him. I thought they would have done the, the Newcastle card. Having Shadj on there, nothing. Obviously, I think Shadj is from South Shield, so it makes sense to have him on that card, but nothing there. LeBlanc versus Shadj, maybe in France, maybe Cage Warriors go back to France. Charrier isn't there anymore, but, you know, it's not hard to come by French fighters. And you could certainly build a card around LeBlanc, in my opinion, if there's a, a title on the line. 
For Scott Malone, disappointing. Hopefully, he doesn't go off for another couple of years. I think he's still got a lot to show. I think he's still a really fun fighter. And they're going to be back in Glasgow. They're going to need uh, Scottish fighters. And, and he's someone I'd love to see again. But for Nicholas LeBlanc, guys, I don't know. Let's give him the title shot because he's just he's too much fun right now. Kei Harvey versus Kaiki Modesto is the next fight we'll talk about. Modesto making his cage war his debut, active finisher of fights. Just one of those, you know, not not to not to be horrible, one of those random Brazilian fighters that they've they've been filling these cards with in recent months. Uh thankfully they've not been overdoing it. Um so it has been competitive to, to an extent. And some of these Brazilian guys have gone on and, and scored massive upsets. Um but Keir Harvey, such a fun fighter is, is Keir. Uh, scored a, a gorgeous triangle armbar submission over Manny Akpan in 2021, then went off and fought in South Africa, fought in Bellator. Has a, a funny career record because he's got two draws in a row. And even as someone who's obsessed with the history of MMA, can't think of a great deal of fighters that have drawn two fights in a row and weren't part of the old school era of MMA where, you know, you fought for 20 minutes and then it was a draw if, if no one finished the fight. Um, Keir Harvey two draws in a row it's really interesting but 7-3-2 well 6-3-2 coming into this now 7-3-2 for me one of the best performers on the card truly like I thought Keir Harvey despite not getting a finish um, it's not all about finishes guys and sometimes you can dominate people in a decision and be really exciting um, but yeah the higher level martial arts guy just really good in this one his jab is fast he's got that flyweight speed at bantamweight Calf kicks were clean. Uh, striking up the middle was nice. Elbows against the fence. Scored it 10-9 to him in the first round. Left hand was there all fight long. Just a really well-rounded performance from Harvey. Scored the double leg takedown against the fence. Pouring jab, left hook to the body. I'll, I'll say it again, but just highlighting it. This guy's left hand is magic. Question mark kick, low kick. He was styling on Modesto. 2018 going into round three in round three i liked the left hand over the top followed by the oblique stomp which is the guy's got such a clean arsenal of strikes to draw from had modesto walking backwards all fight really controlling him and and stepping in one direction and stepping in the other to just pin modesto against the fence check left hook left jab exit the defensive footwork was clean as well whenever modesto did try to step into range Keir Harvey would clock him and then move out really quickly. Scored it 30-27 to him. Hope he really sticks around in the yellow gloves this time because he, he's a really fun fighter and a fun performer and someone that could do some really interesting things at 135 pounds. He's still young and with that kind of speed, a lot of people are going to struggle with him in cage warriors. So the interesting thing about doing this podcast, guys, is that I obviously try to be impartial. And when you're, you know, you're reviewing cards and you're doing breakdowns. And I know that a lot of fighters do listen to this. Um, it's it's very hard to be impartial when you have fighters that you fucking adore. And the main card opener, which should have been the prelim headliner, had we not had many decisions on the prelims, was between Konstantinos and Telis versus Jan Quayhagens. And when I'm talking about fighters, I absolutely love Jan's one of those. Jan pretty pretty sure Jan listened to like the first episode of this podcast shared it um we speak on and off I mean he's he's just one of my favorite fighters um and and I really can't hide it when he fought Paul Hughes I did a lot of gymnastics to really explain to people how Paul Hughes um could lose that fight and how Quay Hagans could hit him with something insane and if they fought again tomorrow I'd probably do the same thing it's hard to avoid sometimes uh Quay Hagans one of my favorite fighters in Europe 16 pro fights, never once seen a scorecard. And of course, this fight wasn't going to be one of those. Uh, props to, to Intellis, though. I've heard Italian MMA guys, uh, Frey on Twitter, I know is, is a huge fan. Um, and, and Frey's always, always got always the plug for Italian MMA. Uh, Frey's huge on Intellis. And one thing that I knew about him was that he's a, a grappling whiz. Five of his eight wins via, sub, via submission. But one thing I always tell people is, you know, people watch Quay Higgins fight and they watch the highlight reels and they think, wow, this guy hits really hard. Timing on his knee is amazing. What they don't realize is that his jiu-jitsu is mad. He's got just next level craftiness and creativity on the ground. I've seen him escape subs that would have put out a lot of people. I've seen him sub people in, in unorthodox ways. 
What I loved in this fight was that it was textbook Quay Higgins, the knees to the body early, uh, the straight left was money. Whenever Intellis decided to kick, bang, the straight left was there, the jab was there. Quay Higgins was nailing him every time Intellis committed to, to a kick. When Intellis did take Quay Higgins down and got caught in the reverse triangle, that's when I thought, hmm, maybe, maybe you don't go to the ground with Yan. But obviously, Intellis backs his grappling pedigree. Uh, Quay Higgins then threw up his legs high for a, a triangle and an armbar. Um, going to, to the ground with this guy is always a bad idea unless you're, you're really, really good. Uh, and maybe Intellis is and, and Quay Higgins are just better. But the, the first round I scored straight to Quay Higgins. Round two, Quay Higgins got the takedown early and it was a beautiful takedown, tapping the knee and, and pulling the back of the leg to trigger the takedown and, and get him on the mat, um, pushing the hooks in and flattening Intellis down just dominating him on the ground and weighing on him, eventually locked the arm underneath the neck and got the rear naked choke. That's 12 and 5 now for the Q-bomb. All fights, the all wins via finish, all losses via finish too. Never once seen a scorecard. I think he's the definition of a prize fighter. And if we're talking prize fighter tournament, you've got to get this guy on there. In my opinion, he's, he's one of the first people. If you've got a hat and you've got 10 names in there, Jan Quay Higgins has got to be one of those. If you've got a hat and you've got three names in there, he better be one of those. Um, and if you've got a hat and there's one name in there, it better be Jan fucking Quay Higgins. Get this guy on that prize fighter tournament. Just an exceptionally fun guy to watch. So prelims, prelims, prelims. Uh, the prelims were interesting because we had a lot of decisions and I think we had four in a row at one point, which is pretty rare for Cage Warriors, in all honesty. Uh, but the prelim headliner was between Albert Diaz and Paul McBain. Paul McBain, tremendous in this fight, really, really good. Um, and one of the better performances on this card, dropping Diaz with a big right hand, flurrying him with, with punches against the cage, kneeing him in the clinch, jumping the gilly. It just looked like he wanted to put Albert Diaz out in that first round and didn't. The second round was where it got interesting. Diaz was trying to take the center of the cage, trying to fight as the aggressor, trying to be on the front foot, but he just didn't have the volume to keep McBain fighting backwards. And that's the thing, like, if you're going to be a pressure fighter and if you're going to be a, a, a volume fighter and an aggressor, you need to throw. And Albert Diaz was throwing singular shots and, and pushing McBain forward, but you can't just walk forward and throw singular strikes. You've got to put a lot of combinations behind. And Diaz didn't do that, and McBain rocked him with a left hook followed him to the ground with some massive elbows, then landed a big left hand as Diaz was getting back to his feet and a knee for good measure. Diaz's recovery rate was was mental, by the way, because McBain was piecing him up and he was just continuing to fight like it was nothing. Uh, the right cross to the body from McCain, just stunning. Diaz's midsection was bright red halfway through the second round. Um, I like the... There, there was an elbow from, from Diaz that I thought was really good, like a sneaky elbow. As they entered, um, as McBain entered in, in range against the fence, but McBain just melted him with a straight to the body, uh, dropped him, got a quick succession of hook, landed a quick succession of hooks, and dropped the Brazilian again. I had it 2018 going into round three, and we wouldn't see a round three because Diaz immediately started pointing to his stomach because the round ended. Potentially a broken rib. I've not seen the outcome of that. I don't know what the injury was, um, or if he simply just couldn't you know was took a shot to the body that he knew he couldn't recover from um but Diaz out on his stool McBain gets it done impeccable performance you know wins after two years away from the cage and after two and a half years without a win eight and three now at 145 pounds that was a real good scrap and McBain I think was just the, the more technical fighter the guy with the most tools um out of the two Diaz tried to do a lot of a lot of forward pressure, but just didn't have what McBain had on the feet. And McBain just took it to him and gave him hell. Great pop from the crowd as well when he won. And I think that the card kind of came to life once McBain got that stoppage in between rounds. A lot of people's picks for fight of the night were uh, Deutsch and Eglin, uh, Europe underscore MMA and Analytics Yan both gave that their fight of the night. Um, and... Gary as well, Europe on the square MMA, gave his finish of the night to Nicholas LeBlond, which I don't disagree with. And, and so did Analytics Yan. So the guys there in agreement. Interestingly, in this fight, 
I mean, I was super up for this. I, I thought this would be like one of the best scraps of the night. And I really think that it was, in all honesty, I think it lived up to the hype. Eglin, one of my favorite rostered fighters, has always fought in cage wars as a pro. Four and two coming into this uh, with, with successive knockout wins. Never seen the scorecard. This was the first time that he would end up seeing a scorecard. Uh, his last outing was against my boy, Rory Evans, which uh, Jack Eglin won by a, by a second round finish. And Dan Deutsch, again, and Dan Deutsch, obviously we spoke about him at the top of the pod, someone that I would love to see fight Reese McEwen potentially. If you don't want to give McEwen a bit of a slow roll, uh, you might want to put rebook that fight between him and Deutsch. Deutsch now 10-2 and two with his win here. Um, nine and two coming into the fight, obviously just a top, top European bantamweight, one of the best, one, just one of the best bantamweights in Europe. Love watching this guy fight. I think he's tremendous on the ground. He's crafty on the feet. He hits hard. Um, and this fight was just, just a great, great, um, showing from both guys. Went the split decision. I personally scored it to Dan Deutsch. I scored it 29, 28 for him, um, in the first round. I loved, to be honest, with the whole fight, the, the uppercut to the body from Eglin, the, the hooks to the body from Eglin were just stunning. But Deutsch, the trip takedown, his judo is clean as a judoka and lover of judo. If I see people getting their uchimatas in and their trip takedowns, very excited. Uh, Haragoshi the, and all of that, I'm all for it. Uh, Dan Deutsch, just, just awesome in that round. Uh, dropped Eglin with a power jab, like a really stiff jab. Uh, followed him to the ground. Eglin got back to his feet and then got dropped again with the jab, which was crazy. Deutsch gets a lot of power behind it, to be fair. And he like steps into it. Like he doesn't just throw the jab. He like throws and steps into it, uh, which I'm kind of demonstrating in front of my microphone right now. But realizing you can't see me, it's uh, it's kind of fruitless. But 10-9 Deutsch is what I scored that round. Round two was all Jack Eglin. And I thought he was going to put Deutsch out in this round. His hands are just so crisp, uh, controlling the cage uppercut uh, landing on Deutsch as he's coming in, the lead uppercut to the body. Uh, Eglin was leaking all over the place. Deutsch was leaking all over the place. Deutsch was busted under the nose, cut under the eye. Eglin was putting hands on him. And I thought maybe Deutsch's gas tank is about to go here. But very impressive Deutsch's round three. Deutsch in round three, just timing the takedown to, to stifle the onslaught of, of Eglin because Eglin was, was ready to hit him with stuff. The combination to the body, Eglin managed to build back to his feet and started dominating proceedings on the feet, just pinning Deutsch against the fence, V-step, lovely, uh, glorious combination to the body as well from Eglin, just, just stunning some of the combinations he was throwing there, the hooks, the lead uppercuts, Deutsch retaliating with like a capoeira kick. Funnily enough, like fun fact, capoeira is the first martial art I ever did as a kid, um, which might sound crazy to people because I just sound like a British dude, but ethnicity wise uh, I am not um, and yeah I grew up with capoeira capoeira my first martial art playing the beating bow and, and all the instruments and doing the jinga and all of that so I'm a huge capoeira guy so when I saw Dan Deutsch pull that off it was pretty fun um, so I'm a big capoeira guy I haven't done it for about I don't know, like 25 30 years um, but I, I loved it as a kid and, and it's what got me into martial arts truly uh, but that that was a uh, enough about me. That was a fun strike from Dan Deutsch, um, but managed to get the takedown of two minutes to go. Just started landing on top. Twenty seconds left of the round, raining down strikes, raining down, raining down elbows, knee to the body, roundhouse to the body. As Eglin came back up, an incredible scrap. I don't think you could argue that Eglin won it, though it was a split decision. I thought that the rounds are pretty clear to score. Round two to Eglin, rounds one and three to the Dutchman, who is now ten and two. 135 pounds, two wins in a row in the yellow gloves. Keep booking him. Again, this 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 gauntlet and, and this this just insane wheelhouse we have at 135 pounds because you've got Keir Harvey who looked amazing on this card, Dan Deutsch, who looked great, uh Aiden Steven as well, who though he wasn't exciting, was dominant and deserves to be right in there, right up there in the mix. Cameron Else put on a show in the co main event. You could even match up some of these guys in another card, like Cameron Else, Dan Deutsch. Come on, that would be awesome. Or even Dan Deutsch versus someone like Keir Harvey or Aiden Steven versus Dan Deutsch. The grappling exchanges there would be would be top. Um, but that was a, a really fun fight between those two, and it it lived up to the hype. 
Speaking of living up to the hype, uh, we had Jordan Little versus Jordan Strong, Battle of the Jordans. Jordan Little came in like three pounds underweight, which was interesting. And the reason I said speaking of, of hype and everything, Jordan Little finally making his pro debut after a 25-fight amateur career, fought in the IMAF Four Nations circuit, fought in the Cage Warriors Academy circuit. You've got 25 fights as an amateur and you're turning pro. You're a pretty scary guy because people will look at O&O and they'll think you're new and you'll go in there and you'll just be an absolute veteran in the cage. Uh, Jordan Strong come into this fight 2-0 and as a pro, undefeated also as an amateur, so combined record of 7-0, and five of those by way of finish. This one was always going to be really interesting and it was another split decision. But what was fun about it for me was Jordan Little's uh, striking. God, like, for me, it was it was just so much fun. And an analytics Ian on Twitter had Little versus Strong as his uh, moment of the night, Jordan Little winning that. Just, again, a, a lot of people watch this and think it was boring. I can't, I can't even bring myself to agree. Little is so, so crafty. Crescent kick, the Anderson Silva-esque upward elbow. Um, I was there when Anderson Silva knocked out Tony Frickland in cage rage, like there in person. And seeing Jordan Little trying to land a similar thing was just was just awesome. Strong was really good in this fight and, you know, tried to attack the neck, did really good on the ground. But the scrambling from Jordan Little, he just made himself just really slimy and slippery on the ground. Uh, scored at 10-line Little in round one. Round two, I gave it to Strong, though Little had a, a really clean elbow and knee as they came to their feet whenever they disengaged from the grappling. Uh, clock strong with a big right hand towards the end of the round. Tried the flying knee as well. But on the ground, that's where Jordan Strong scored. A couple of submission attempts. Tried to attack the neck and flatten Little out. Throwing up his legs for the triangle off his back. I thought he did enough on the ground to, to, to get that round under his belt. And then in round three is, is where I scored it as, I believe, the, probably the swing round for a lot of people. It was a very competitive fight, uh, but Jordan Little got his hand raised in his pro debut. I scored it 29-28 for him. Straight right hand, landing flush, following it up with a takedown and dragging Strong down onto his back, which was really good. The elbow over the top, uh, the spinning elbow. Then Strong went for a guillotine towards the end. This fight was just awesome. Really underrated fight. Jordan Little, 1-0 and now as a pro. Keep an eye on this guy because, like I said, you've got 25 fights as an amateur. You're going to come in as a pro and you're going to do a madness. And I think he will. Uh, striking on this was fire. And I hope they put him in there next time against someone that will just stand with him for 15 minutes because he's going to put a lot of people out with that unorthodox arsenal of strikes that he has. Now Ariano versus Jamie McDonald was also a fight on this card. It's the only fight above welterweight, which props to props to the Cage Warriors matchmakers and Ian Dean because uh, without sounding like a prick, Typically, anything above uh, welterweight and some middleweight is just can just be a bit shit, really. Uh, and Nell Ariano versus Jamie McDonald actually delivered one of the few uh, finishes on this prelim card, which was which was great. McDonald came into this fight three and zero as a pro, uh, hard hitting bruiser on the ground, really good on the ground. Missed weight by three pounds though. Nell Ariano. I think on the other side, just a really credible amateur fighter, a guy with IMAF appearances, nine and four as an amateur. Um, did have a fight in Cage Warriors as as an amateur as well, or couple lost and drew, uh, but lots of finishes. Made his pro debut here and went on to to win via finish. Impressive first round from him. Left hook was was piercing the guard of, of McDonald, and it was it was about time that that would be be one of the strikes that would lead to the end. Uh, of the fight. McDonald obviously tired, he missed weight, uh, and, and it showed in his performance. Ariana's punching away at his head on the ground, then stopped punching to try and adjust the position. Felt like more volume would have earned in the TKO earlier, but then he just realized that, hey, I don't really have to adjust my position. Let me keep punching him. And in continuing to punch uh, Jamie McDonald, he got the finish in round two. Good performance. Excited to see how they match him up next if we see him again. Cage Warriors at 205 can be a bit sparse and you don't really get a crazy amount of fights, but maybe he's a guy you take over to the San Diego scene. Got some big boys in America and maybe now Ariano could could you know put it on a few of those guys like what's Chuck Campbell doing 
for example. Maybe maybe that's something you put together. But good on now Ariano getting one of the few finishes on these prelims. We had Deck Dean versus Michael Blair. Interesting fight this. I scored it 30-26 to Michael Blair. I think Deck Dean is a decent fighter, but Michael Blair uh, controlled the entirety of the first round. In the second round, it was interesting because neither fighter had ever seen... I believe Michael Blair had only gone to a second round once and Deck Dean had never gone to a second round. And so, of course, this would go to the decision because that's MMA for you. Uh, but Michael Blair... Flying knee on Deck Dean in round two was good. Uh, but on the ground, it was just few and far between. Uh, and the, 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 what Deck Dean was able to do was few and far between is what I'm trying to say. Uh, Michael Blair was just super dominant. 2017 Blair in, in round two, I scored it 10-8 to the Scotsman. Round three, Deck Dean was just diving on a takedown and Blair nailed him with a knee. Probably the most impactful shot of the whole fight. Blair was pounding away at Dean's head at one point. Almost drew the stoppage. The ref was warning Dean to movement and Dean was obliging, crushing elbows from, from Michael Blair. Just a really good, bruising, dominating performance. 30-26 Michael Blair is what I scored it. Eagle Wojtas versus Ronald Shahan also took place on this card. Eagle Wojtas, a pretty sizable underdog coming into this. 10-9 uh, and nine as a pro, started his career 0-4, then won 6 on the trot. Has fought Cage Warriors adjacent opposition in guys like Sylvester Miller. Uh, former title challenger, Shadj, current uh, champion at 125, and Kiru Sahota. And Ronald Shahan, obviously, uh, part of the, the influx of Indonesian fighters we've been seeing through the MMA Fight Academy, um, impressed in his Cage Warriors appearance last year over the then undefeated Andrew Johnson Cabrera, previously fought for that um, road to the UFC show on the UFC, lost to Ray Saruya. I know this isn't a Japanese MMA podcast, but... Ray's one of my favorite prospects and has been since his Pancrase days, um, following him for quite a long time. So it's good to see him in the UFC. Uh, side note aside, um, Eagle Wojtas won this very, very comfortably. 30-27 for me. Um, Shahan, just nothing off his back, really nothing. And we know that Indonesia doesn't tend to produce really, really good grapplers or, or people who are good off their back. But Ronald Shahan, once you get him down and he was put down in this fight, he struggled to get back up, scored at 30-27. Eagle Wojtas got his hand raised as an underdog. We had Ian Postlethwaite versus Pau Sahota. Ian, just an awesome bantamweight, in my opinion. Extremely underrated. The ferret, 12 years fighting as a pro. Six and six coming into this, but who gives a fuck about, about records? But, you know, riding a three-fight win streak, Shared the cage with Liam Gittins in what was Gittins' pro debut. So some fun like Cage Warriors history there. Obviously, this was for another promotion. Pav Sahota, brother of Kiru Sahota, uh, has one appearance in, in the Yellow Gloves and was knocked out by Sam Kelly in what was at the time the fastest knockout in Cage Warriors history. Uh, has since gotten back on the win column, uh, in the win column on the regional scene. Postle Thwait in for me, was had one of the best performances on this card. Even though it went to a decision, like I said, not every decision means that the fight was dull. Um, he was so good. Just a savvy veteran performance on the feet and on the ground. Um, just awesome stuff in here. Left hand from from Ian was, was so good. Uh, body lock takedown, tying up the triangle. That left hand, though, was crisp. And, and there were some good left hands in, in this fight, but Ian's left hand was good, whichever way he threw it. Left hook straight left, the jab, like everything that this guy did with his left hand was stunning. And then the grappling was was great. Using the left hand to set up the grappling in the clinch and in the collar tie, uh, Pavsahota was doing some good work, elbows and uppercuts, but the knee as well on Postle Blade was good from Sahota. And I, I honestly thought in round two he was going to finish it, but that was one way to take away Ian's left hand, but he never went back to it. And Ian was just dr drilling him right? Just drilling him. Nasty knee on Sahota towards the end of round two. Busted him open with some elbows. Round three was one-way traffic. Ian Postlethwaite, I tweeted this after the fight, records off at DJs because, you know, especially as an underdog coming into this, which I imagine he was, he, Ian was just awesome. One of my favorite performances on the card. Just a great display of all-around mixed martial arts. So we're winding down here towards the end of, of these breakdowns as we talk about the, the first two fights on the card. Kadim Dia uh, defeating Mushaslani via decision. 
Kadim Dia improves to 4 0 now, three wins in the yellow gloves. This one wasn't a blockbuster by any stretch, but only one fighter wanted to try and find the finish. Uh, it was a grueling and grinding battle, but Kadim Dia was the one trying to trying to finish the fight. Mush Aslani had moments on the ground, but really wasn't throwing, wasn't hunting submissions. Uh, and a correction there, it's 5 0 now for Kadim Dia. So, someone to definitely keep an eye on, another Italian prospect. He's blown hot and cold, was fun in his last fight against Esposito. This one was a bit dull, and his fight with Cabral as well was dull. Um, but he's he's very, very good on the ground, and I think that he'll be able to blanket a lot of people. Pretty interesting fighter at 170 pounds, I think. And and also, maybe he's someone that you do him versus Sean Clancy Jr. Maybe that looks good on the record of Sean Clancy, someone who's a, a good defensive grappler, someone who's a powerful fighter, someone who's undefeated as well. Maybe that's the next fight that you do. And that's a, a really fun one if they match that up. And then the prelim opener, which is the last fight of the 16 fights that we'll talk about here, uh, is Cornelius Aratonang versus Thomas Hepburn. Aratonang, all it took for him was was a minute of good work. Uh, massive prospect coming out of Indonesia. Slick, long striker, but someone who can also grapple, uh, which is impressive as well. Back-to-back -back wins in his rookie year in the Yellow Gloves last year. Uh, had a knockout win over Matthew Moyer uh, back in November. Hepburn here making his Cage Warriors debut. Solid amateur record. One and one as a pro. Lost to Michael Blair, who had a great performance on this card, as I mentioned. But it didn't take long for Aratonang. Pretty much standing straight arm bar to get the takedown, which is which is unorthodox and unique. Uh, tried to take the back. Hepburn building up to his feet. And in doing so, Aratonang just jumped on his back and drew the quick tap from the rear naked choke. Jumps up to 4-0 now. Someone that definitely needs a slow build. This is the type of matchmaking you, you surround him with, in my opinion, for the next 18 months at least. Uh, but definitely someone to keep an eye on, I think, Cornelius. And so that's pretty much Cage Warriors 171 in the bag. A really fun card. Didn't have the the pop and the the excitement that it could have had if Reese McEwen and, and Chris Bungard had won. But in return, we got a massive prospect in Gerlin getting a huge win under his belt. And a, a former UFC fighter and someone who has fought in the yellow gloves coming back and really staking his claim at the top of the scrap heap at £135 potentially putting himself in title contention, Cameron Else. Big prospects got their wins here as well. Sean Clancy Jr., Nicholas LeBlond, uh, Dan Deutsch as well. Fun finishers like Jan Quay Hagens managed to get the job done. Veterans like Ian Postlethwaite and, and Igor Wojtas got their business done as well. Jordan Little, if we're talking prospects, someone to keep an eye on too. It was a fun card. It wasn't it didn't have all the finishes, it didn't have all the excitement, but some really good back and forth scraps. Next time we talk will be Cage Warriors 172, where Harry Hardwick is going to fight for the featherweight belt against Zafar Mosen. Nick Bagley's on that card, Milad Hardy, who I love, is on that card, and against Orlando Wilson Prince, so you know that's going to be a banger. Chris Price back in action. Michael Shamu, where have you been? He's back. Uh, the kickboxing extraordinaire, the Jaguar. Very excited to see what, what he can do. Um, but that kind of wraps up this episode of the pod. If you've enjoyed it, as always, guys, leaving a like or, a, you know, review, feedback, anything, retweeting it on Twitter, helping the pod grow. Uh, it's, this is what, this is what you can do to support it. It's, it's free. Uh, I don't make a penny off of it. It's a passion project. And the fun that it brings me is being able to connect with people about Cage Warriors and about UK MMA and European MMA and being able to connect with fighters too. So if you enjoyed this, please share the love. Otherwise, I'll catch you all on the next one.